Hi, everyone. I'm hoping everyone made it in okay. My name is Leah Fish, and on behalf of the entire Linden Hills Neighborhood Council, welcome to the Virtual Waste Forum. Um, I am joined tonight by Kelly Kitch and Adriana Salsa. Adriana, I don't know if I said your last name correctly. Is it Salsa? Uh, Adriana Salsa. Salsa. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. They're with Minneapolis Solid Waste and they are the experts for tonight. So thank you so much for your time and for joining us. They're going to do a 30 to 40 minute presentation followed by 20 minutes of questions. So during that presentation, I ask that you put your computer or your device on mute. And then if you could hold your questions until the end, um, that would be wonderful. I think that's it. So without further ado, I hand it off to Kelly and Adriana. And again, thank you both for your time tonight and for being with us. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having us. We would yep. like, you know, we would way rather be in person with you so you could touch and feel all the crazy things I have sitting on my desk. and you know, get more questions answered and hopefully we'll be able to see you all in person here in the next year. And Adriana is, uh, we're really happy to have her. She's a Minnesota Green Corps member who's serving with our office for the next eight months. Oh my gosh, time goes yeah. so fast. So she's with us through August. So hopefully we'll get to be in person before she leaves us. Um, but we do all sorts of outreach and education for the city. And we're gonna try and answer a lot of the common questions um, as we walk through the PowerPoint uh, presentation here, but, you know, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat um, or, you know, raise your hand at the end and we'll make sure to answer all those specifics too. So now let me get this moving. Make sure it's working. Can people see the screen? Someone say yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So here we go. All right, so we're going to talk not only about what goes where, but we're going to do a little overview of both the recycling process and the uh, organics recycling or the composting process as well. And then wanted to share a little bit of info on um, the large items that get picked up on your curb and how those are managed. And then, of course, a little bit about waste reduction, because that is our ultimate goal is to reduce waste so we have less to manage in the first place. Um, you guys probably all know this, solid waste and recycling. We provide collection services to all buildings in the city that are four units or smaller. Um, buildings that are larger than that can opt in to a service from the city. Um, there, uh, It's a different fee structure for businesses, but some businesses also participate in like a recycling only or an organics recycling only service through our office as well. And uh, the annual mailing that um, you get will, it's at the, it's going to be printed this coming week. So stay tuned to your mailboxes in a, probably mid-February for the next annual mailing that'll have additional information for you. So first and foremost, where does it go, our waste? Um, all of our garbage, residential garbage, goes to the um, waste energy facility in downtown Minneapolis, that is HERC. Um, so it does not go to a landfill. Um, all of our, uh, the cell transfer station, many of you may, anyone brought anything to the cell transfer station drop off through a voucher, maybe? Well, it, um, as a city customer, you get six vouchers a year to bring up to 2,000 pounds of extra garbage, construction, demolition debris, um, scrap metal, appliances, electronics to that facility. Um, that location is here. All of the garbage that is brought there goes to HERC again. Mm -hmm. And then the construction and demolition debris will either go to a landfill out in Burnsville, or it will go to a construction and demolition um, sorting facility. And then what can't be recycled from that would go to a landfill down in Shakopee. All of our recycling picked up goes uh, to Eureka Recycling. They are right over by the University of Minnesota. And that is where they sort everything from the blue carts back into 15 different categories so that they can be made back into new items. And then all of our organics, um, once they're picked up and our yard waste, go to this purple dot here. Um, and that is a transfer station 
where they load the organics and the yard waste into semis to ship them out to SCT's composting facility out in Rosemount. And they do that at the transfer station so that we're driving uh, less trucks a farther distance away to get them down to the compost site. And that is where all of your waste goes. So our trucks, the city vehicles, never leave the city limits to pick up anything or drop it off before it gets out to its final destination. So the fun, the fun question, what makes something recyclable? Everything metal can be recycled. Everything, no, I shouldn't say that. Everything metal can be recycled. Some plastics can be recycled. But the real differentiation between what can and cannot falls on these three items. First, they have to be able to be picked up. That one's pretty easy. Second, they have to be able to be sorted. If the facility cannot sort it correctly, um, then it's not gonna, it's not going to be able to, or not, I shouldn't say, it, if it can't be sorted correctly or in an economical fashion, it doesn't make sense for them to be trying to sort the stuff out in the first place. And then the last one is that someone has to want to take it and turn it into something new. Um, and we will talk about this here in a little bit, but right here, our friend, Mr. Black Plastics has challenges with both being sorted correctly and also the fact that people don't really want to buy this stuff to turn it into something new. And again, we'll, we'll revisit him in just a minute or her or they. Um, so the sorting process, um, I'm going to briefly walk through this. And if you want to um, see the sorting process in action, I encourage you to do a Google search for Eureka Recycling Story of a Cereal Box. Um, and they have a video that shows you the facility through or the tour through the MRF. MRF is uh, short for Material Recovery Facility where they do that sorting back out. Um, and once we're back to a more in-person format of life, um, we do offer monthly tours of that facility that you could sign up to actually go and walk through and see it in person as well. So the very first step at the recycling facility after the truck dumps recycling onto the floor is a front end loader will scoop it up and put it into this hopper. And what this is going to do is help level the material out so that when it goes through the system, it's in a nice even layer. Um, and then here is a picture of the tipping floor. Um, can you guys see my cursor when I do that or? Okay, good. And then the next thing is it's gonna go through a pre-sort house. And that is both of these two other pictures on this slide. And what happens in the pre-sort house is there are actual people pulling out things that never should have been put in recycling carts in the first place. There are always at least two people pulling off plastic bags or plastic film. Someone is always pulling off random metal items, scrap metal, um, tanks, um, anything that could uh, cut the belts of the, uh, the conveyor belts at the facility or get jammed in the equipment. And then someone is always pulling off large plastic items like a Rubbermaid tub or um, a kid slide. You'd be amazed at all the things that they've seen go through this facility. They've had a chicken, which now is happily living with one of their employees. Um, we've seen, oh, just so many things like the, uh, the battery powered cars that kids drive around, one of those all in there. We've seen doors from chest freezers. Um, so anything that isn't supposed to be in the cart in the first place, this is where they're gonna try to take it out to keep it from um, causing injuries or damage to other parts of the facility. The next thing that happens is uh, the, these two pictures on the top, these are called star screens. And what they do is they help separate our two dimensional items or our papers flat from our three dimensional containers. And so what happens is these rubber discs as they spin, papers go over the top of them and the containers will fall through the cracks. Now, the biggest, sorry, one second, the biggest issue at recycling facilities are what they call tanglers. And those are going to be things like our plastic bags. And as you can see on the picture on the right over here, what happens to those if they get through that pre-sort house is they get wound around the gears 
and they clog up the spaces in between the screens so the containers can no longer fall through and they start going over the screens with the papers and end up in the paper. So as of right now, um, Eureka Recycling and pretty much every recycling facility in the country is shut down for several hours a day. The people have to physically climb in this equipment with box cutters just to cut out those plastic bags. So very, very important. No plastic bags, no garden hoses, nothing long and stringy should ever be going in recycling carts. So after this first, the first star screen, uh, the, the gears are pretty far apart um, and that's gonna take most of the cardboard off. There'll be a couple additional series of star screens where they get smaller or uh, closer and closer together to get different grades of paper like your uh, mail and your magazines and your newspapers um, to keep those separate from the big thick pieces of cardboard. And then at that point, your containers are all separated from your papers. The next step is um, what is called an eddy current, or if you've ever taken the uh, two magnets and tried to push the, you know, the reverse ends together and you can't physically get them to touch, that current is an eddy current. And what that does is it repels aluminum cans away from it. So that eddy current is right at the base of this uh, conveyor belt here and the cans are jumping up and away from that current into a separate container. So all other containers will fall straight down this first pocket and the cans are going to jump over that because they're repelled away by that current. Um, the next step is an optical sorter and optical sorters are what are used to sort out our plastics. Um, they can also be used to sort things like your cartons. Um, what they do is they use a laser light, they shoot a laser light at an item and it, it is able to identify the chemical composition of a plastic or a piece of paper, um, whatever it is trained to be looking for. And when that sorter finds what it's looking for, it tells the system to use a puff of air to shoot that into a separate compartment. So it's kind of hard to see here, but um, much like the cans are jumping away, the optical sorter is pushing away certain items and other ones are falling straight down. And at Eureka Recycling, they have an optical, they have two optical sorters. One of them is pulling car, uh, cartons off and PET or number one plastic. And one of them is pulling off um, number five plastic or things like yogurt containers and cottage cheese, sour cream type tubs. So after that, um, I open, and I skipped a step, there's also a really strong magnet that will suck up any of the steel items. So your soup cans will get sorted that way. And then there is another pre-sort or a, a, another sort house where people will pit, hand pick particular items. So um, like your number twos will be things like milk jugs or laundry detergent containers. Someone will be pulling all of the number twos that are colored and someone will be pulling all of the number twos that are not colored, like the milk jugs are pretty uh, translucent. Um, from there, once everything is finally all sorted out and they've gone through a quality control, they all get bailed into these beautiful big bricks. And then they get shipped off to markets to be made into new items. And a good benefit of uh, partnering with Eureka Recycling, they keep 100% of the recyclables um, from the city of Minneapolis and the other communities they sort recycling for within North America. 90% of them stay within the upper Midwest and 80% of them stay within the state of Minnesota itself. So the question of do my recyclables get recycled? The answer is yes, so long as they are things that were supposed to be put in your recycling cart in the first place. Now to do a quick walk through um, by material type, papers, all of our office and school junk mail type items can go in all of our boxes from uh, pantry items or boxes from medications or toiletries. And then don't forget the laundry room, boxes from things like dryer sheets if you use them or if you use a powdered laundry detergent, those can all go in as well. It is 
recommended to flatten them because as that first step of the recycling process, it sorted two dimensional from three dimensional things. So if you have a small box, it could potentially fall down instead of floating over those star screens to make it with the other paper. Um, things that should not go in, paper plates, ice cream tubs, coffee cups, and Asian takeout pails. Couple questions on paper. First one is on envelopes from windows. You do not need to remove envelopes from windows. Uh, when your papers get recycled, they get put into a giant mixing bowl. And in that mixing bowl, the fibers break back apart, releasing that little window. And it will float to the top at the paper mill and get skimmed off. And then all of that paper pulp in the middle will move on to be made into a new paper item. And shredded paper is probably one of my biggest pet peeves on the planet um, because I think people get shred happy and there's very little thing, very little reason to shred items and very few things actually need to be shredded. Um, so things that you may need to shred, you know, maybe a, I don't, I don't even know. I don't shred anything, I'll tell you. And if I had a bill, I do most of my billing online. But if I had something that I had any sort of privacy concerns about, I would tear my name and address off. And then even if it's a health statement, without your name or address, it doesn't matter whose health information it is because there's no name or address to tie it to someone. So I really encourage people to try and uh, avoid shredding paper as much as possible. Your typical piece of paper can be recycled up to seven times, but when you cut it all into tiny little bits, you've now reduced the fiber lengths that make up that paper. So they can only be recycled like maybe one time after that. So encourage you to not shred paper. Uh, metal, this one's fun and easy. Um, our food and beverage cans, um, also aluminum foil and trays. Thing with our aluminum foil, sometimes people you know want to fold it flat. What did we learn at the recycling facility? Flat stuff goes with the paper. So if you have aluminum foil, you want to ball it and you want it, the ball to be a couple inches in size so that it is going to get uh, to the containers um, so that it can actually um, meet that eddy current and get pulled off. Um, yeah, that's a big one. And then uh, in terms of metal, like I said at the very beginning, everything metal can be recycled but the only things the recycling facility is designed to sort out are going to be those items that are the food and beverage containers um, or paper from your household. And then metal bottle caps. Oh, I don't have this example up here. Oh, and I skipped this in my thing. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. So one other thing at the recycling sorting facility, if we back up a bit, is our glass. All glass at that facility is intentionally crushed. So. At that point, anything that's less than three inches in size, so this here plastic cap off of this glass bottle, is going to fall off of that container. Um, so any sort of metal bottle cap is likely going to be too small to make it to the container line to get properly sorted. So any metal bottle caps you have, if you want to put them in your recycling cart at home, you are gonna to wanna to put them inside a soup can and pinch the top shut so that it can't fall out. So the metal cap is contained inside the metal um, can. All right, and other things like your pots and pans, pipes or poles, a bucket of nails, those need to be brought to a drop-off location for recycling. Um, glass. Only again, our food and beverage containers can go in. A uh, common question is mason jars, those can go in. Now the other things listed on this slide like a uh, drinking glass, window glass, Pyrex, those all have strengthening additives added into them that make them not recyclable um, and need to go in the trash. Now I had already mentioned that all of the glass at the recycling facility is crushed. So if this fell on the ground and broke in half, it's totally fine for me to put that into my recycling cart because it is a recyclable glass item. 
Um, the reason that we could not take broken glass way back multi-sort days is because people had to physically pick up all of those bags and it was a safety issue. Um, but now that it's in a cart and no one is physically touching the stuff in the cart, um, it, they are fine to go in there. And then we kind of already talked with the lids, make sure metal lids go inside a metal container. Plastic lid could go inside another um, like type plastic container. So I could put this tiny little guy, say, well, that's a bad example, in another like plastic container, screw that lid on, only do it with one or two of them because otherwise our plastic container filled with plastic lids is gonna be too heavy for that puff of air from the optical sorter to properly push it away for recycling. Uh, cartons, pretty easy one here. Any milk, soup, juice, broth cartons are okay to be recycled. Although it is mostly made of paper, they do want these sorted as a container. So we do not want to flatten it or it will then act like a piece of paper and not stay three dimensional like a container. Um, caps on these, it's a plastic cap on a paper item. Although they're not currently recycled, just like technology with cell phones and everything else, we don't know when that's going to change. So please keep the caps on, or that's the simple message with recycling is keep the caps on. And the newest one are our cardboard cans. Things like a biscuit tub or uh, mixed nuts. Um, what they really want here is this metal bottom. The metal bottom is a food grade steel. But common question is, do I peel this all apart and just put that in? If we just put the piece of metal in, what is it? It is two dimensional. It's gonna act more like a piece of paper than a container. So leave these together. All right, now the fun one. And this is, this is the show and tell. Everybody hold a hand up and then put your middle finger down. We have one, two, four, and five. One, two, four, five. These are the plastics that have markets that can be recycled. Now, look at the slide here. What number is missing? Number four. Number fours are mostly these guys. So your plastic bags um, can be recycled, but they have to go to a drop-off location. So when you're looking at any other random plastic thing around your house, that's your easy way to remember. Is it a one, two, or a five? You're not really gonna see many number fours for uh, food and beverage containers anymore. They were most often um, like the lids to a cottage cheese container, but they have all pretty much since been uh, moved over. Now the number three items that are out there are, is this lovely stuff right here? It's that stuff that's super sealed. You need a scissors to open and then you still like cut your hand open getting in there. That is a number three and that should not be going in your recycling cart. The only other real place you're gonna see number threes um, are going to be in like shower curtains or PVC piping um, that obviously like bathroom piping. Um, that stuff cannot go in there either. And then other than that, it's um, just like everything else, food and beverage type containers. And don't forget things from your bathroom or your laundry room. Um, so lotions, uh, shampoos, here I've got a toilet bowl cleaner. Trick with the pumps. The pump has a bunch of different components inside there. So do remove the pumps and throw that piece away. All right, caps on or off. We wanna leave the caps on. The fun thing with plastics is when they get recycled, um, the very first thing they get all ground up. And once they're ground up, it's called flake. Um, it gets washed. And this is, this is some flake. That is some flake. And uh, the cap plastic is always different than the bottle cap plastic, or almost always. But once it's washed, you saw what happened, they will naturally separate in water. So even though they're two different types of plastic, they can recycle both of them. Now, if your small plastic cap is loose, it's gonna fall through all of that sorting equipment and end up in the glass. And this is what glass looks like coming out of the facility. You see a bottle cap in there. There's a crayon somewhere, there's a plastic cap. So leave your plastic caps on your plastic containers. 
Um, and then I'm, I'm, I have so much information, I'm going to run out of time if I answer all of these questions, but we can come back to the ones that you think are most important when we get to the question and answer time. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to Adriana to talk a little bit about organics quick. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I am going to talk about organics recycling. Uh, the city, so I might get some of these dates wrong. I'm still kind of new at this, so Kelly, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we are, the program started in 2016, Kelly? I don't, dates I'm a little fuzzy on, but uh, currently- a tricky we, one, because Linden Hills actually was the pilot area. So they okay. technically started way back in 2008. <laughs> nice, well, nice job everyone. Um, but we currently have around 50% of households signed up for organics recycling, which is really, really cool. Um, so just talking a little bit about organic recycling, it's a bit different from what you think of backyard composting. So um, it's all picked up curbside. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the process, what happens when you put your organics from your, your bin in your household to the cart on your curb. Um, so yeah, Kelly, if you wanna go to the next slide, actually, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, so what happens after you put it in the bin? It gets picked up from our collection crew, organics collection crew, and is taken to SET. Um, and there they go through kind of a lengthy process of getting those food scraps and um, compostable packaging all down into the final compost product. So it starts off with a agricultural mixture that just takes um, all of the, the dumped organics curbside um, together, mixes it together, um, tries. Uh, I'm a little, a little, I got to tour there a long time and I wish I could go back and learn more about compost, but um, it goes through the agricultural mixture, some front end loaders, um, all to get put into these kind of large piles. Um, I don't, you can kind of see them in the bottom photo, uh, but they're essentially just very long tube like piles of going to be compost, but not yet. They still have to get um, broken down here. Yeah, this is a better image of it. Uh, so you see these rows and that's all of uh, the food scraps and the curbside organics stuff before it's been turned into compost. That's where they go to turn into compost eventually. But um, in those piles, they'll sit for a, about 45 to 60 days, I believe, before they're, um, ready to get processed some more for compost. So they'll kind of sit there for a while and have these aeration tubes that are underneath the piles that are providing oxygen so that the microbes can do their work and break down these food scraps and compostable items um, into what we know as compost. Um, and during this whole process, during that 45 to 60 days, uh, SET is taking temperatures, making sure that um, the compost is getting to around 140 degrees, I believe. Um, and that, that number is really important because uh, when it gets to these high temperatures, it's killing off uh, diseases like E. coli, you know, all of these things that uh, normally like all everything goes in the organics compost and the uh, official Sorry. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to say is, so in a normal backyard compost, you can't put things like meat or eggs because you've got issues of E. coli. Whereas in this more official large scale compost, uh, these piles are getting to these high temperatures that are able to kill off this bacteria and um, sort of these other dis pathogens. So that's really important that they're getting to temperature and they're constantly checking for that. Um, and then other uh, com official compost sites will turn and there are other processes of screening to get rid of further contamination towards the end of the, the 60 days. As you can see here in that bottom left photo, um, you're getting the, the sort of the contaminants that haven't been fully uh, biodegraded yet on the left. And on the right, you're getting that final compost where you can see it's kind of this really nice 
rich brown uh, coffee-like texture. Um, that's what we want to see in compost. And during the screening, we'll get a lot of things like, um, I think, believe this, maybe it's a milk carton. Kelly, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but it's kind of the this empty shell of something that someone probably thought was compostable, that was paper, but then there was this coating of plastic that wasn't able to be broken down in the compost process. And so they're kind of screening at the end here for these larger pieces of plastic that will ruin the end compost product. So that's kind of what they're doing there. And then testing, constantly testing this final product to for contaminants and making sure that it is good, usable, healthy compost. Um, and it's used in a lot of different projects. We've got, uh, it's used in state highway projects, corporate gardens, community events, neighborhoods um, can come out and pick up a whole bunch of compost and use it. We got lake bank restoration. Um, compost is great, used for everything, used for a backyard garden. Um, can't, I love, I love compost, it's great. <laughs> um, okay, so then talking a little bit about what is accepted in the Minneapolis curbside uh, organics collection. All food. So <laughs> that's pretty nice because backyard compost is a bit limiting where you can't put things like meat or bones or dairy due to that pathogen um, spread. So organics recycling bin, you can put any type of food, not just organic food. It could be, you know, pizza or whatever. <laughs> um, hopefully what's going in the organics bin is not food scrap or is only food scrap. So things like onion peels or things that you can't eat as opposed to um, just uneaten food. Um, that's kind of a goal is you wanna make sure that food is getting eaten and not going to waste. And the thing that this compost um, tool, this um, the organic recycling is used for to recycle food scraps. Um, it's Kelly, if you wanna go on. Yep. So. Other things that are accepted where it gets a bit more tricky, but uh, food service items. So that includes uh, like non-recyclable paper items. So that's paper towels, pizza boxes, although pizza boxes are can also be recycled. And if you have more questions on that, you can ask that later and Kelly and I will describe that further, but they are compostable. Um, you've also got egg cartons, napkins, paper plates and to-go containers. But there's a little caveat with these um, that some paper plates and to-go containers have plastic lining or have other materials that are not compostable. So it's really important when you're trying to decide if these to-go containers or paper plates are, can go in your organics recycling bin, you want to look for the BPI logo. Um, so in Minneapolis, you can kind of see on the bottom right of the slide, there is a logo logo of a leaf and a tree and it says BPI. So this is a third party certification that um, kind of just reassures that these, these specific products have been tested in a lab and can be broken down within the 45 to 60 day um, compost process. So we can trust that these will be broken down in our current uh, compost recycling um, facility at SET. So anything with that symbol on, good to go in your recycling bin. If it doesn't have that symbol, you could go to bpiworld.org and search for that company product name. If it's there, great. If it's not, it does not belong in your organics recycling bin. Um, and so then other compostable products that are allowed are Q-tips, uh, cotton balls, pet and human hair, popsicle sticks, nail clippings, house plants. Um, just as so long as there, there's no other additives or plastic on those Q-tips or any of these other items, but they're all good to go in your organics recycling bin. Um, okay, and then a little, a little more on what's not accepted. Um, so I learned, I've been learning a lot during my service of like what is compostable and what is not. So I was really surprised to see like ice cream tubs or like takeout pails are not recyclable because um, I kind of think of them as paper products, but they are lined with plastic and other materials that do not break down in the compost process. So please keep milk cartons and ice cream tubs and any other kind of Asian takeout pails out of the recycling bin. 
To the right, you can see that is a milk carton that you see this kind of transparent shell of what wasn't broken down in the compost process. So those are not accepted. We've also got yard waste. You know, we have a separate yard waste collection that does get composted, but please keep that out of the organics recycling bin. Um, currently, the state does not allow pet waste, litter, or bedding. Um, we want to keep as much grease or oil in large quantities out of the recycling bin. It can be broken down, but in large quantities, it's a bit difficult. Um, so we want to keep that to a minimal level. Uh, other things not allowed by the state are diapers and sanitary products. Those should go in the trash. Um, cleaning and baby wipes have chemicals, you know, that ruin the end compost products. So keep that out of the recycling bin. Um, we also are concerned with microplastics from textiles in the wash. So we also ask that dryer lint and dryer sheets are not put in the compost bin. Um, styrofoam and other foil on products um, not, are not to be put in. And then, like I mentioned, non-certified certified compostable food service items should not be put in the organics recycling bin. And so I guess a little bit on that, I'll touch, um, don't wanna talk too much, um, but greenwashing is a thing, you'll know, you'll see a lot of products that say um, made from plants or earth friendly or biodegradable. There aren't a lot of um, official definitions about these terms. So any company could essentially put them on their packaging, but that doesn't mean they're going to be uh, actually broken down and composted in an official compost setting. So we want to watch out for that and make sure that items that you're putting in the recycling bin are, or the organics recycling bin are EPI certified. I just want to add one real quick thing. So the biggest difference here is that with recycling, we talked about people pulling contaminants out um, throughout the process. And with organics recycling, that doesn't happen. So anything that's going in that cart is ending up in that compost pile. So this milk carton skin you see here, this piece was big enough that they were able to screen it out, but all of the little bits that are missing are microplastics somewhere in the compost. So it is really, really important if it doesn't say it's certified compostable or you are not sure that it should be going in there, don't put it in the organics. And then for the sake of time, I think let's, oh, sorry, now I'm going the wrong direction. Let's skip over these questions and we can come back to them if, if they're yep. come up. Oh, we'll skip that yep, too. Sounds good. Um, do you want me to talk about this one real quick? Adriana? Sure, yeah. Okay, so um, real quick on yeah, yeah, yeah. our large item program, um, you can set out large items and most people don't really know what happens with them. I just wanted to make you aware that the items that are recyclable are um, getting recycled. And in fact, um, all of the appliances and the metal items will actually be physically disassembled. They will remove all the Freon and other gases from appliances at our shop um, in Northeast Minneapolis uh, before they get shipped on to recyclers. Electronics get uh, collected, put in a, a, a freight car and shipped directly onto a recycler. Um, and we pick up about a railroad car full of electronics every single day in the city of Minneapolis for recycling. Um, you'd think it would slow down. You'd think the CRT TVs would stop coming in, but they are still coming in every day. So just wanted to make you guys aware that um, those items are getting recycled, that the money that uh, we get from the revenue or from the sale of the metals is going back to help keep the program costs um, as low as we can. And then um, Hennepin County, just uh, this kind of a nice little overview. Um, where we're at, they sorted Minneapolis residential trash back in 2016. And you can see 40, almost 41% of it was actual trash. Um, almost 25% was organic. So there's still a lot of work to do on getting organics out. However, I should note that this was done right before we rolled out the organics program citywide. So it's a little bit skewed. Um, still a lot of recyclables that they're finding in the um, garbage as well as other items that could be diverted um, so they're not ending up in the waste energy facility. And then you want to talk about the survey? Sure, yep. So uh, and from November to December, we the 
the Office of Solid Waste Recycling wanted to know how COVID has changed how people are um, purchasing, reusing, and disposing of items. You know, we're, we're all home more. Um, so we wanted to know how um, that might affect um, their relationship to how they view their items and um, the new things they want to buy or, or how they're disposing of items. So um, we had this 2020 waste behavior survey and just briefly um, found that 65% of residents um, were more aware of the waste they created in their own home. Um, and then as we're seeing in the chart below, um, a lot of uh, kind of staying the same, but increases in thinking about if they need an item before buying, um, you know, trying to find something borrowed or used before buying new, and then considering the carbon or water footprint of uh, something before they actually purchase the item. Um, so that's all really good, um, kind of inspiring things that we're, the office has noticed, and we want to roll with that for 2021. And we are putting out a new campaign for shop smart, love your stuff, and reduce waste, um, kind of going through plastics, textiles, and food you know, trying to show the um, upstream costs of the things that we're buying and, you know, loving this, the stuff we own and then in the end, reducing waste. So um, that's the plans for 2021. Um, couple of tips on low or being zero waste. So really thinking if you need an item before buying it um, and then looking at what you already own, shopping what you own first is a really good technique. Um, repairing or mending the things you already own um, or borrowing or shopping secondhand are great um, alternatives to buying new. Um, and if you really you know, wanna buy something new, making sure that that item is durable and long lasting, you know, seeing if you could use reusables. So that includes like water, uh, reusable bags, silverware, food containers, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Um, then you want to, and then maybe while you're purchasing, look for items, have one of your considerations be how much plastic or packaging is in the item. Um, you know, the whole goal, we want to reduce packaging as it does create a lot of waste. And as we heard from Kelly earlier, there are some plastics that can't be recycled. So we want to, um, you know, when up front, we want to reduce that waste in the beginning. Um, and then buying things in bulk is a great way to reduce packaging and plastic. And then at the end of life of items, you know, if we can't find a use for it, we want to be able to find um, someone else or something else that can have that use for that item so it continues um, to be used and re um, consuming less resources in the process. Um, so other, you know, waste production resources, uh, we want to work with other neighborhoods and would love to work with Linden Hills on a waste awareness event. So a couple examples. Tangletown has a textile series where they're talking all about textile waste and how to prevent it. They've got an upcoming event uh, this Saturday. Um, so you can check that out. And that's all about shopping or how to take care of your clothes. So you buy less. Um, and then we've got the neighborhood Armitage in Minneapolis here that is doing a plastics awareness series all about the struggles of plastics. Um, how to reduce your plastic intake, et cetera. Um, and you can check that out. They're screening the Story of Plastic documentary, which I have not watched, but I've heard it's very good. Um, and then we've got more county resources from virtual fix-it clinics to fix any broken items you have, um, choose to reuse, which gives you information on how to shop secondhand if you're not familiar. And then they currently have a plastic free challenge um, you can, the actual challenge starts tomorrow, but you can sign up today, highly recommend. And they've got a bunch of other challenges coming up in the works this year from preventing food waste and other zero waste challenges. So a lot of, lot of waste production resources out there and we will hand it off for questions. Sorry, we talked a little bit longer than we were going to. <laughs> yeah. A lot of information. Kelly, there were a few questions in the chat. Do you want to start with those? Sure, um, so let's see. Uh, one, I'm not sure. Can you see them? Yes. And okay. I'm seeing the first one is from Elizabeth and how clean do items have to be? So the cleanliness of say like a salad container or a berry container doesn't really affect the recyclability so much of this can, well, I'm sorry. 
it doesn't affect the recyclability of the plastic. Where we get into troubles is if it really affects the weight of the item and those optical sorters can't use that puff of air to push it out um, to the proper location it needs to go um, is one issue. So you don't want a half full bottle of water going into the um, recycling. Um, the other thing it can do is it can affect the recyclability of your paper items. So if you get a bunch of salad dressing all over your junk mail, then you're affecting the recyclability of that paper. Uh, the biggest question that always comes up with how clean does it have to be is around peanut butter jars, because we all know how much fun it is to try and get peanut butter out of there. Um, what I've actually discovered is if you use um, some hot water, like if you kind of, if you make tea, like some decently hot water, put that in a peanut butter jar, just swish it around a bit. Most of it comes out. I was really shocked by that. Um, but you can also just take, you know, a, a, a paper towel or a napkin that hopefully you've used for something else and just try and get out as much as you can or even use a rubber spatula. And so long as it's, you know, about the appropriate weight, it would be empty and mostly free of uh, food. So, you know, 90% um, it is fine to go in the recycling. Um, Okay, then the next one is cloth scraps. Heard at one time cotton fabric cut into four by four inch or smaller squares can go into the organics. Um, this is all sorts of tricky stuff. You know, back when you guys started with the organics pilot, you could put things like milk cartons in freezer boxes and all of that stuff in. But the more and more um, composters are learning about different products and um, how confusing it can be to find an actual, you know, cotton or linen shirt. Um, I mean, cotton's a little bit easier than linen at this day and age, but um, they do not want textile scraps anymore um, because people were maybe not so much paying attention to, is it actually 100% cotton? Um, and I think the other reason they changed their mind on that was because the county no longer accepted uh, clothing, unusable clothing for recycling at their drop-off sites. They didn't want to be inundated with the material. Um, and though some people were really good at cutting it into the required size pieces, many people weren't and just threw a whole shirt in there. And then that really got caught in that agricultural mixer and caused them all sorts of processing questions. Um, do you want to answer any of these, Adriana, or you want me to just keep going? Uh, I mean, you can keep going. <laughs> okay. uh, paper towels and napkins. Yes, all of them can go in the organics without being certified compostable. A couple caveats there. If you are using a chemical-based cleaning product with your paper towels, then you would not want to put that in the organics. Same thing with like a cotton ball. Um, just because most chemicals aren't really tested to be sure they're safe for human use before they're put on the market, they are definitely not being tested to make sure that they will fully and safely break down in the composting process. So um, if you're cleaning up a spill or, you know, whatnot, and it's just a little bit of food this, this or here or there, those are all fine. Doesn't matter if it's white or it's orange or whatever color it is, napkins and paper towels are fine for the organics sands, any form of chemicals being on them. Oh, my favorite question. Why can cardboard milk cartons be recycled but not ice cream containers? They both seem to have the plastic coating on the inside. Yes, they do. You guys are gonna love this answer because I can't really give you a straight answer on this one. <laughs> um, so cartons are a really good example of um, producer responsibility where there's actually only like seven, eight companies that make these in the entire world. And they all came together and worked with recycling facilities and worked with paper mills to get the recycling facilities, the abilities to sort these out. Remember three pieces are being recycled. One is you have to be able to collect, easy. Second is you have to be able to sort. Third is that someone has to want to use it. So they helped the recycling facilities get the equipment to sort them out. And they helped the paper mills develop a new pulping process or the process of breaking the fibers in here back down um, so that the paper mills would also accept them. Um, I don't know why ice cream cartons can't go in. Um, I think the same thing. Uh, but what all the recycling facilities say is yes to these and no to those. Now I get why these guys can't go in. 
um, because, well, there's a couple different reasons, but if it's identity, if the optical sorters are identifying this outermost plastic layer on this carton, there is not one of those on coffee cups. Um, so I don't have that straight answer for you. It's one I often look for a better explanation as to why, but for now, ice cream cartons, uh, paper ice cream tubs still have to go in the garbage because I'm also not aware of a single compostable one that exists. There are, however, two and only two in the world, companies that make compostable ice cream or Asian pails. Um, they are not anywhere in here in the Twin Cities that I'm aware of though. Okay, our next question. Um, how should metal be recycled to avoid the random metal object problem? Aha, so anything metal, let's see if I can get these out. I've got a hanger and I have a fork. And yes, this fork did get stuck in the facility, recycling facility. This is what it looked like after it got out of there. Um, these can all be recycled. You can even take the metal off of this little guy and he can be recycled. Um, this type of stuff has to go to a scrap metal drop-off location so that it can properly get sorted by metal type and get to the right place where it's all with its like friends um, for actual recycling. Now we're really fortunate in Minneapolis that there are a ton of scrap metal dealers around the area. So if you had enough of something and it weighed enough, you could potentially even get paid for it. Um, but any of these types of things, like you see this fork is just beautiful. You don't think that can't cause too many problems. This fork shut the recycling facility down for three to five minutes. Um, hangers can do the same thing. Um, I didn't bring it, I ran to the office today to get all of my stuff here and I didn't bring it home, but I have this beautiful toaster that you like can't even tell is a toaster because it shut the, it's so smashed and defigured. Um, but anything metal can be recycled. Um, another thing that you can do, so our large item pickup that we talked about, if you have a, like a ton of these metal hangers or you have um, a broken toaster and a broken disc man and a broken, you know, whatever, you can keep all of those smaller electronic or smaller random metal items together in one box um, and then set that out for pickup when it's full. Um, but think, you know, think about it. We don't want to send a separate truck around to pick up like, you know, one pan. So if you have like really bad pots and pans that really just can't be used anymore, set the full box out. Or you could also do what I do. I keep a box in my basement for all that type of random stuff. Um, and then uh, batteries and light bulbs. And I will go to Hennepin County with that box to their drop off sites once or twice a year. And they will take all of that scrap metal stuff as well. Um, we are gonna have a, a new, our, our what to do list on our website is getting a facelift. It's gonna be called the disposal guide and it will be searchable and it will be launching here in the next, hopefully two weeks, might be three. Um, but that will, that will provide an even greater opportunity to, to find out how to get rid of some of this stuff properly. Um, next question, old batteries. Ooh, uh, your alkaline batteries, so the non-rechargeable uh, most common battery you find out there are non-hazardous. You can put them in the trash. Um, if you want to keep them in that box of stuff you bring to Hennepin County, they will recycle them there, um, but they can also go in the trash. Now your rechargeable batteries um, do need to be brought in for um, a, to a drop-off location. And we will hopefully in a couple of weeks here also be announcing a new battery drop-off uh, program since we had to discontinue our uh, battery pickup back in December 2019. Um, and then make sure if you have any lithium or lithium ion batteries um, that you tape the at least the positive end. It's just easier to tape both ends with a clear plastic tape. Um, lithium ion batteries, th these are the ones that are in your cell phones, they're in greeting cards, they're in flashlight, they're in cameras, they're in laptops, they're in tons and tons and tons of things. They have the ability to start fires when punctured and a lithium ion battery burned down an entire uh, transfer station in Minnesota two years ago. And they are the bane of the entire waste industry. Um, we had a truck fire I want to say six or eight months ago where they literally had to dump the entire truck on the ground where they were 
because something in it started on fire. They didn't identify what it was, but I think we all believe that it probably was from a battery. So very important that any rechargeable batteries do get properly uh, recycled. And again, we hope to be able to announce um, a new drop-off option for everyone here in a couple weeks. Uh, old clothing, throw them away. If they are not wearable, then unfortunately, yes, um, that is where they need to go. Or um, dust, dust rag is a good, good option for old clothes. Um, yep, and if it's like flannel. Yeah, so how it goes hierarchy. Yep. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say like uh, some of the animal control or um, animal centers may take old flannel or certain types for um, animal beds. Um, as another option before their end of life. But yeah, cut them up into rags, do anything sorts of fun um, with them that you can. You know, the, the reason Hennepin County stopped their textile recycling program is after it left Minnesota, they could not guarantee they were getting recycled. And the county could not in good conscience allow stuff. They were telling people was getting recycled to go overseas to be someone else's garbage problem. But um, you know, when you're shopping, if you need to shop, make sure you're buying high quality items. They might come with a little bit higher of a price tag, but they will last longer. Like your $5 t-shirt that you wear once and it gets a hole in it. Those are the types of things we don't wanna be buying. We wanna to, want to buy quality so that it is something that's repairable, that's gonna last us a long time and or we can pass on to someone when we're done. Do you wanna add anything to that, Adriana? Oh, no, no, that's good. I want to, we should talk about black plastic here really quickly. Oh, yep. And then we're going to get cut off. So, okay. Last okay. question of the night. Black plastics. Uh, what should we do with black? Okay. Black plastics. Uh, those used for planting, reuse mine or take them back to the growers. What is wrong with small black plastic containers? Um, all right, here we go. Black plastic. So our friend, Mr. Optical Sorter, who sorts plastics out, right? He uses a laser light to identify the plastic. The color black absorbs that laser light. So the system can't even tell that there's something there that it's supposed to be trying to read. Um, now we said that people are hand sorting their plastics, um, hand sorting certain plastics. They could in theory hand pull every black plastic, but the problem with these is, is they are not all the same number or type. The number inside the, the recycling symbol just is telling you the type of plastic. That's all it does. It says nothing other than that. So for them to actually sort these out, they would have to look at every single one of them and say, are you a one, are you a two, are you a five, are you a six? One, two, one, five, and six are the most common for your food service items. So again, three things of what makes something recyclable. Can it be collected? Sure, can be collected. Can it be easy and feasibly sorted? No, not so much. I mean, if you have to physically, someone has to look at every single one of them, that's not really feasible. And then the last part, does someone want to buy it? Once it's been dyed black, you can't really dye it any other color. Um, so there are not really good markets for this type of material either. So until they are all the same type of plastic, black plastics are not really going to be a, a very feasible thing um, for us to be sorting. But reusing them is great because although they're not recyclable, they can be reused as food con saving containers, but ultimately at the end of life, they do go in the trash. Yep. And then Kelly, we, we, we are going to have to end pretty shortly here, but there is one more question that um, okay. Anne had, and it's a question, it's something that I see too. Some of our neighbors, they put their recyclables in a plastic bag, they put oh. the plastic bag in the recyclable bin. Yep. That's a big no-no. Correct. Is there anything we can do to spread the word about that? Um, well, so we've done a, we've done a lot about uh, plastic bags and recycling carts. In theory, the recycling crew should be tagging those people, um, and they will get the little friendly cart hanger at their house or at their at their cart. They'll get a letter in the mail. Um, we do also, yeah, it, it's a really tricky one. Um, eventually, we will take their cart away if they keep doing it. So um, I guess. They will be motivated at some point if they want their recycling cart back to no longer bag their recycling. Um, but just like plastic bags themselves are a problem in recycling, when recycling is in a plastic bag, it's, um, it's a repeat 
action for the crews to rip open bags that can cause workmen's comp issues. It can cause injuries. They really don't want to be ripping open bags because they have no idea what's in there. There could be um, hazardous, you know, medical waste in there. There could be just plain trash. So they're most of the time when they see those bags in there, they're pulling the full bag and it's going in the trash. So one thing you could tell, you know, neighbors that you see doing that saying, hey, you know, your recycling is not likely going to be recycled if you continue to put it in a plastic bag. Um, would be one nice thing I, I think you could say. You could also say, hey, your cart might get taken away eventually. <laughs> but Thank you guys. That's, yes, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And um, thank you, Adriana, so much for your time tonight. That was really helpful. Um, I know I learned a few things and we will be posting this on our website and I believe Becky's sending it out through the Linden Hills e-newsletter. So this will be dispersed and hopefully other people can watch at their leisure. Um, and in the beginning, you mentioned you might wanna partner with Linden Hills on something. I have a few ideas. We can chat about that later, but let's definitely keep that on our radar and do something uh, something different with that. Yeah, and if you yep. if any of you have any questions, our emails are on the slide.